Hello, and thanks for coming to this session. I'm sure you've already heard a lot about decentralized identity, interoperability, and standards. I was a bit relieved to see that many adapters, so at least the interop problem with my device worked out quite well. Um, today, I'll try to make it short because I know lunch is coming right after this session and you're probably all hungry. But what we will be talking about is a brief one-on-one um, -on -one session on what decentralized identity is. Some of the market trends, which are also relating to wallets and why they're coming, which I think is also very use always very useful to understand why all this is actually happening and why we got identity wallets as a big topic for at least some sessions um, during this conference. Then there's a couple of slides on adoption, what you can do. I'll mostly jump over them to not bore you too much, but you get the slides. I think you should be able to also download them from the websites. And then I'll give you a demo and uh, a couple of links, including links to uh, open source, an open source that then you can use to build your own pri uh, prototypes and get started. Uh, but first things first, um, what is decentralized identity and how does it work? Um, it's always useful to start with the problem. Uh, right? And one of the internet's biggest problems is the lack of trust. If you're interacting with someone online, you have no idea who this organization, person, or device actually is, who it belongs to. There's no built-in identity layer into the web. And so what happened is that workarounds became the standard. Everybody who was building websites and applications had to take care about their own identity stack. This is what you, what you can see here on the left-hand side. So what we're stuck with today is the situation where we have all these data silos, where data is disconnected and doesn't really work together with a lot of horrible downsides, which you can see on the right-hand side, um, mostly related to you know, user experience, security, privacy issues, and lack of data control. And so what can we do about it? Identity wallets are a potential way out because if we have trusted data in our applications and we can easily share it with whoever we want, then we can prove who we are online. And by this, we can solve this lack of trust problem. Uh, and this is the fundamental promise of decentralized identity and identity wallets, right? The idea is that users can control data. There's no federation that we have today or no silos that we've been seeing in the past. We can easily share data with just one click in a way that's more secure, where we can also trust that the organization that is asking about data can be verified. We have compliance based on existing, but also new regulations like the IDAS 2 regulation. And obviously, you know, fraud can be more easily be prevented, both in terms of verification of physical documents, but also for digital interactions. How does it work? Um, you may have heard in the session before about the trust triangle. Um, very briefly, the whole idea is we got data sources, think of governments, universities, basically whoever has interesting data about you, and they can simply issue this data in a digital format to a wallet. With the wallet, you can then manage and share this data easily with so-called verifiers or relying parties like banks, employers, online platforms, who can then verify this information without having to get in touch with the issuer. So we can avoid this phone home problem. Uh, and that fundamentally is the paradigm shift that we're looking at uh, today with uh, regards to the identity industry, where we're moving from this era of silos, which are dominated by centralized and federated identity, to this new era um, of ecosystems enabled by decentralized identity and identity wallets that become kind of the API for our data to third-party service providers. Um, why is this actually being pushed not only by regulations but also by organizations around diff across different verticals? Well, at the end of the day, and you can see it here below, we can just onboard users much faster than we could before with a much better experience at a fraction of today's costs in a way that's compliant with these new emerging regulations like the IDIS 2 and have more trusted and accurate data as well. So lots of huge benefits if we're thinking about all the problems that we have today with digital identity. So why now? Um, I've been working on decentralized identity for the past six years. So I was lucky enough to see a lot of stuff coming and going. And I think we can, one way to really make sense of why everything's happening is looking at five different trends that have been evolving over these past five to six years. I'm quickly going through each one of them. 
starting with regulations. Um, so regulations and regulators are enabling the market by resolving the cold start problem. So in case some of you don't know what the cold start problem is, it refers to this problem that if we have a marketplace, uh, we need a supply side and a demand side, and how can we build this? And so one of the big problems with decentralized identity and you also saw it here, is that it's basically a three-sided marketplace. And so how can we get issuers to actually issue digital credentials into a wallet so it can be verified? There's not that much value for issuers themselves. And so what regulations are doing is they open up these data sources by, in certain cases, requiring issuers, highly trusted issuers like governments, to issue digital credentials to wallets. Um, they require the establishment of a wallet infrastructure. Again, the EIDAS II requires the um, provision of identity wallets by governments to citizens, and they force acceptance. Again, for certain verticals, this is forced by the EIDAS II regulation, particularly verticals and service providers that are uh, very important for our everyday lives. And all of this, what all of this does is make sure that we can have highly trusted credentials, for example, related to our core identity, that we can have wallets that, that we use, as well as certain verifiers to kickstart this, uh, kick this whole flywheel and make sure that this whole thing, uh, decentralized identity is actually being put in practice. And, and Europe, obviously, is one of the leaders here in that space, much, much as we have been with regards to GDPR. EIDAS II is the first regulation that has been ratified. Um, we're working with customers all around the globe, including public um, sector entities, and they're all looking towards Europe uh, as, a, as a template of what they can do to also make sure that decentralized identity can be adopted in their, their countries. The second topic that's important is this idea of uh, identity ecosystems. Um, you need them to establish trust. So what do I mean by this? Um, I can very easily just issue, self, uh, issue a self-issued credential to myself saying, I'm Luke Skywalker, and you know, who, 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 would, who would really trust this? So what we need is so-called trust anchors. We need this for the public key, as a public key infrastructure. We need this as a verified registry for organizations. So we need something to anchor trust for certain metadata to make sure that all of this actually works. And so looking at this trust anchor in terms of a technology perspective, um, we're looking mostly at traditional PKIs or DNS-based system or systems or even more decentralized systems like permissioned or permissionless blockchains. At the end of the day, the technology itself is not so important because different technologies can be used. However, obviously the technology choice will be aligned with the governance structure and will determine how, de how decentralized and resilient the system actually is. Um, there's also, you know, rules to the game. So each identity ecosystem has a different governance system that determines who can run nodes, uh, who can act as issuers, how are issuers and verifiers uh, actually verified so that people can, can trust and share as well as receive data from them. Uh, and they're also um, govern the ecosystem itself, right? What are the voting rights? How can someone join? On the right-hand side, I included a couple of identity ecosystems that we're seeing today. I think only two years ago, the list was much shorter, maybe one or two. But now what you can see are public sector ecosystems that are coming up, ecosystems by international organizations, by private businesses in different verticals as well. So we really see this flourishing of new identity ecosystems coming up, although it's still uh, early days. Uh, third topic. Standards enable interrupts. So decentralized identity, as the name says, is, is a decentralized system. So data must easily flow from one system to another. And this can only happen if we have global standards. And I think you've heard a lot in the prior session about the, the standards that are currently being uh, put in practice. I think the most important ones are definitely around W3C verifiable credentials, ISO mobile driving license, uh, SD JOTS, um, OpenID Connect as the protocol for data exchange. Um, all of this to say that we moved from a world where everybody basically built their own credential formats and protocols five years ago to a world where right now we have been able to do interrupt testing with a bunch of organizations globally based on these emerging standards, um, which obviously still leave a little bit room for improvement and to become more specific, uh, but it works in practice. And we've been building also solutions with other organizations where very easily you could issue from, for example, uh, our open source deck to another wallet and then verify it with a third solution as well. So a lot of stuff is happening here. Here too, and I think standards by now are moving to a space, to a place where we can build large scale production systems using different solutions to avoid vendor lock in to a specific stack. Third point developer infrastructure and tooling. So, 
at the heart of every technology revolution are builders, developers, who actually make sure that there's these applications and use cases uh, that are then used by, by, by individuals and businesses. And so um, on the right-hand side, you can see a couple of logos of organizations that are building developer infrastructure and tooling. But I think the important note here is that um, there is a vibrant community of existing companies and newly emerging companies who are all trying to make it as easy as possible for developers and organizations to start using decentralized identity, to build identity wallets, issuance and verification solutions. And there's also more and more open source solutions available to make sure that you can start frictionless without having to invest heavily up front uh, and just build the stuff that you need under permissive licenses. Last point, wallets enable adoption. Without wallets, we're, we're lacking the missing link um, in the trust triangle. And so um, I think one of the things that is really interesting and important to understand about wallets is that we have wallets today. We have wallets for fiat currency, like Apple, Google, Samsung wallet. We have uh, wallet, crypto wallets like MetaMask and others. Um, what we don't yet have broadly adopted our identity wallets. But the thing is, all of these existing wallets that are already used by people and all the um, learned behavior can really be utilized, such as that we can take a fiat or crypto wallet and just upgrade it to also become an identity wallet. And I put the Microsoft Authenticator here because it is, of all of those, uh, probably the first application in the identity space to actually become a full-on identity wallet. They may not yet be supporting all the open standards, but if you check the Microsoft Authenticator, you can already see that there's um, a button where you can request digital credentials. Many of you have already probably also seen that Apple, Google have been rolling out identity capabilities in 12 states in the US. So there's also a lot of stuff happening here. Google is also contributed to the, contributing to the Open Wallet Foundation. And so, you know, these wallets are used by more than 3 billion people today, which means that there really is an existing wallet infrastructure on which we can build to very quickly roll out identity wallet capabilities to a broad range of people and organizations. And it's not just existing wallets. You can basically think about any application as potentially becoming an identity wallet. There can be social applications, that can be banking applications, that can be healthcare applications. And we're seeing more and more organizations um, starting to do this, right? Turn their application into an identity wallet, such as that it becomes more important to their users because this is where the trusted information is being stored and can be shared from. So if we put these different trends into three buckets. I think it's fair to say that we got this foundational layer, which is mostly about regulations, government, governance and trust establishment, as well as standards and interop. Without this, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to actually start building applications. But then we get to this level of infrastructure and dev tools that includes not only the solutions that you need to build issuers, wallets and verifiers, but also the trust registries that I mentioned, um, right? There needs to be public key infrastructure using different technologies to actually make this work. And then on top of that, we got the value creation as the last step, which is organizations building actual applications and use cases um, to create value for businesses, for individuals down the line. And, and this will also be the layer with which most people will be interacting. Adoption. So I brought a couple of case studies just to give you an understanding of uh, what's happening and what we're seeing. Um, unfortunately, I cannot name all the logos yet, but probably a lot of this will become official. But here are a couple of selected examples. So right now we're working with a large government that is uh, rolling out uh, identity, let's say a national digital identity platform, where the whole idea is that there will be issuance, verification services, as well as wallets, not just for core ID, but also for travel, for education, for employment, for healthcare. So the idea really is in this country to bootstrap and go from basically nothing uh, to a system that's based on identity wallets um, within the next year or so. Um, there's also uh, ended, maybe you, some of you know, know about this, which is the Thai Digital Identity Service, which is looking at use cases around banking financial services, as well as interactions with the revenue office of the government itself. So here also there's a government regulatory sandbox, and there's plans to uh, provide Thai, Thai citizens with access to digital wallets and digital services um, in the course of the next year. Um, 
both of these projects outside of Europe. I picked them purposefully because I think you've already heard a lot about uh, European identity initiatives today. Um, but there's also stuff going on, for example, in the insurance space. So in the course of some of the large-scale pilots within uh, the European identity framework, uh, the German pension uh, insurance as well as the Austrian Social Security are also building uh, pilots and prototypes to digitize insurance cards to make sure that workers' insurance can be mapped digitally and can be uh, also easily verified on-site, uh, and also the rolling out of an identity wallet in the course of the DC4U as well as the EPSI vector projects. One building more on the EIDAS2 stack, the other building more on the European blockchain service infrastructure. Um, there's stuff happening also in the Philippines uh, on the procurement side. Procurement is interesting because um, you have so many different organizations and vendors that you have to interact with, and this is really where decentralized identity can shine because you have so many unknown things and you need to verify so many things. And so one of our customers is building procurement solutions for the Philippine government to make sure that um, businesses that apply for tenders that get government uh, business opportunities can easily onboard on the systems, can easily be verified um, to, to provide services to the public sector. Um, lots of stuff is happening in the education space. So we got universities building pilots for the last two years or so in Europe, uh, across, across Europe from Portugal um, up to the, to the Nordics. Um, use cases include student onboarding, student IDs, digital diplomas, all these kinds of things. Uh, again, happening also, uh, but not only in the context of these European large-scale pilots, which are supported by the European Commission. Um, there's also a lot happening in banking financial services and, and the fintech space. Um, one interesting example is uh, the, a project that we have with a, a scale-up called Funding Box. They're basically distributing um, grants as well as investor money to organizations. And the reason why this is interesting is because they're not only using... Um, I want to say traditional decentralized identity standards like verifiable credentials or mobile driver's license, there's also a use case that involves soul-bound tokens um, simply to um, ensure compliance with uh, regulation like the transfer funds regulation, where I have to somehow show that if I pull money from a crypto asset service provider into a non-custodial wallet, I'm the same person who controls this. And how can I actually do this in an, an environment where we don't have decentralized identity established, but where a lot of the stuff must happen on-chain? as well. And so this is also part of the uh, European regulatory sandbox by the Commission where we're currently in touch with regulators to figure out, okay, we have all these identity technologies that are being pushed by EBSI and by EIDIS2, but there's also uh, on-chain identity services that are a bit more problematic from a privacy perspective, but it could be very important if we're talking about use cases related to asset, asset management, decentralized finance, and so on. Um, yeah. Maybe to finish off, uh, a lot of identity verification services are also looking into that space, uh, as well as identity access management solutions. So you can think, basically see that um, all the organizations that are already providing identity services on the market to authenticate users, to verify their identity, are also now moving into that space to provide identity wallets, as well as new verification services to customers, such as that hopefully in the future, you will not only have uh, the option to verify your identity with biometrics, like taking pictures and videos of yourself and then that being matched to a government database, but um, by using identity wallets for that too. What to do now? So again, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because uh, I think you can get the slides later on if that's interesting, but um, what I've taken here is um, from, from playbooks that we've created working with customers just to help you understand how to actually set up such a project and what could be sensible steps to take. Um, we got three points on theory, theory two on practice. Uh, at the end of the day, um, what, what you should really starting with when you try to evaluate the solutions or decentralized identity for your organizations, you gotta find opportunities. And I'm not sure how many of you here are on the technical side of the business probably most and how many are on the business side. Um, but at the end of the day, you gotta convince your internal decision makers to, to actually get a project on the road. And I think here are a couple of costs and ideas, uh, sorry, um, points and ideas that, that you can really use to con convince them to, to get a first prototype or pilot or project started. Um, here also a, a matrix that you can use <laughs> to, to, to convince them. Uh, number two, looking at use cases. So once you've got the uh, opportunities and risks mapped out, 
it's always useful to um, frame the use cases that you want to start with. And here, we always recommend to you know just create a list in the first place and then look at, okay, what are high, high impact, easy to use um, use cases? That's obviously the low hanging fruits that you want to start with. And then you can move to higher impact, harder to implement. Typically, these will be use cases where more parties are involved. So it will be a little bit harder to also get them on board. But there's a lot of ways in how you can actually achieve this. So again, you, you got the slides. You can look at this um, later on, or we can also talk about it uh, with, in, the, in the Q and A session after this after this presentation. There's also some checklists that we provided to to help you communicate and make sure that you think about everything that's important. Uh, the next next thing is obviously defining requirements. So you know why you want to do this. You got the use cases, and so now it's all about uh, making sure that you can formalize the use cases, understand what's happening. This is really important because uh, a lot of people don't understand the complexity that's actually involved in building different use cases and how just small differences in the way a user interaction is structured has a huge impact on the underlying protocols. Um, I mentioned OpenID Connect before. Um, there are so many different flavors and variations variations of how OpenID Connect can be made to work. There's so many different requirements that go into building synchronous versus asynchronous flows. And so I think having clarity about what actually is happening in your use case and make sure you can map that to the underlying protocols is critical if you want to achieve a quick win, let's say, in a month or two. Um, roles, we talked about this a lot, right? Who do you want to build for? Are you building an end-to-end -end use case? Are you just building um, a limited use case, maybe involving two roles? And then the technology stack. And here uh, you can see how we're thinking about the technology stack for decentralized identity. Um, what we're seeing is, and that's also how we're building the open source stack that you will get a link to later, and that's, that's uh, on GitHub under the Apache 2 license, is that there's core infrastructure with different uh, modular capabilities and libraries uh, that you can just, you know, pick and, and build stuff however you need it, including cryptography, DITs, protocols like OpenID for uh, VC, uh, or the different credential formats that we've talked about. Obviously, um, on top of that, APIs and applications, but then I think another thing that we've seen that's super important um, if you want to build solutions for large organizations is that you, are super, that you remain flexible with regards to integrations of underlying infrastructure. That obviously includes things like key management, data storage, cloud services. It also includes the integration of trust service providers and their services if you're looking to build solutions compliant with the IDAS2. But then also the registries, right, the PKIs. Um, you can obviously bootstrap with your own PKI or in the beginnings, but then in the long term, you should have a good idea of which type of solutions and technologies you want to use to um, have public key uh, and, and public key infrastructure and a trusted organization registry being set up. And then with which applications do you want to integrate to build your use cases, right? Um, all things that you need to consider to make sure you're successful. Then step four, build versus buy. I mean, basically you got these three options, right? You can build the apps and buy the infrastructure. You can build the apps and own the infrastructure, where which we refer to when you use open source software, or you can build everything. Um, the problem, obviously, with building everything is that it's um, almost unfeasible to do unless you're building a complete company just to stay up to date because so much is happening. Um, the first step is obviously, the first option is obviously the fastest with least overhead. But at the end of the day, you, you're becoming dependent, especially if you're picking stacks that are tightly vertically integrated, which um, may become a big problem down the line. And so what we're seeing most customers do is um, rely on open source infrastructure and then just building their applications, their proprietary applications on top of it, because that way they can easily self-manage, they can own the solution, have a lot of control and flexibility. So yeah, that's the, that's the suggestion, right? Build apps by your own infrastructure because you really don't want to get into um, building your own solution, your own KMS solutions, your own data storage solutions, your own libraries for cryptography and different credential standards. Again, unless you want to build a big business unit or a, a business itself that's just tasked with building and maintaining this over time, simply because so much is, is still changing and so many new flavors and standards are being added over time. And then launch and expand. So let's quickly check. Oh, we got a lot of time for questions later on. I got a demo here. So we just had a new release today. And this new release, we rolled out a new wallet UI. Oh, need to connect to the internet. 
So I just wanted to quickly show you this demo. Let's see if the oops. Let's see if the sound works. Otherwise, I'll give you the voiceover. It's a new water. Okay, sound doesn't work. I'll just talk about it. So you can also check this out and try it for yourself. It's available under wallet.wallet.id. Um, basically here what's happening is somebody signs into a, a web wallet. So we got different ways of building wallets. We can also talk about the difference between custodial and non-custodial later on. Uh, but here in the demo, we're starting off with a progressive web app just to make sure that you can have a smooth web first experience. And then we're also adding a mobile application um, to there. Uh, although this mobile application here in the demo is also built with the progressive web app, um, but there's also Android and iOS SDKs for mobile native capabilities, including you know, on-device key storage. And so here what's happening is um, we're just showing there's a credentials and an issuers menu. Here's a did, which is your identifier that you will be using in the first um, interactions that you have. Gotta make it a bit faster. So there's no issuers yet because you didn't receive any credential. Um, but now um, we're looking at the, an issuer portal. So this is also um, our hosted application that you could try for, for testing yourself. It's available under issuer.walt.id. And what you can uh, think of here is that can be any portal. It can be a portal by a government, by a bank, by any type of service provider where you authenticate. And once you're logged in, you can basically request different credentials. Uh, in this case, we're picking a bank ID, assuming that this could be a bank login. So typically, um, a user would just see this um, QR code that they would scan. Um, but going a step back, here you can see uh, the developer experience of this issuer portal, just so uh, that allows you to easily configure different things, including the types of credentials that you want to go with. In this case, a W3C verifiable credential in JWT format with a DIT JWK. Um, you can also see different authentication methods here. In that case, we're using the pre-authorized flow. Obviously, you can also have authorized flows where you have to authenticate yourself. Uh, got lots of different options here and flavors for enabling this open ID based credential presentation. But in that case, we're just going with the web uh, based flow. So now we're here being presented the credential in our web wallet. On the right side, we see the progressive web app on the mobile phone. Um, so it's not yet refreshed, which is why you cannot see the bank ID yet, but it's refreshed now. And there we go. So you see it on the mobile as well as the web based flow. Again, all of this is open source and you can just build your own use cases with this to get started and get a feeling for how difficult this is. And now what we're doing is we're um, adding another credential, but in this instance, we're not using um, W3C verifiable credentials in the JWT format, we're using SD jots. Um, so enabling selective disclosure for this credential for an EID, just to make sure that you also see that we can have selective disclosure capabilities um, based, on, based on standards. So in that case, we're claiming it not via the web-based flow, but we're doing it uh, with the mobile flow. So we're accepting now this credential. There it is. And then we're, you can have a look what's in there. The different attributes and here you can also see the selectively disclosable attributes. So here you can see that um, instead of, as in the case for W3C verifiable credentials, you cannot only just um, present the whole credential, maybe you just want to pre present an individual attribute or two individual attributes from this credential. And that's possible thanks to the signature scheme. So now what we're doing is we're switching from, oops, that was a bit quick. We're switching from this um, issuance to the verification configuration portal. So here you can see that we're requesting two IDs, the bank ID and the EID. In one case, we're um, going for, um, yeah, the bank ID and the EID. And then down below, you can see the different credential policies for verification. Obviously, there's lots of things we can verify, like the signatures, like uh, whether the credential is expired or not, um, and so on. And you can also add your own verification policies to that. Um, but in that case, we're requesting the presentations. The QR code um, allows us to, to link this to the phone. And then you can see here the presentation request. You can see 
the, the different attributes, if this is now opened, the EAD tab. And here you can select which um, different attributes you want to share. And there we go. So here then you can see that the credential has been verified. You can see the policies that have been executed. And if you flip that card around, you can also see the information that has been, has been provided. So again, all of this, the issuer, the verifier portal, as well as the wallet is all open source available under the Apache 2 license. And again, you can also find it online under issuer.waltid, sorry, portal.waltid for the issue and verifier portal, as well as the wallet.waltid. Um, progressive web app. I also put some QR codes here uh, in case you want to check it out on our GitHub. Again, um, the Walt ID identity stack is open source on the Apache 2. You can build end to end use cases with this um, free of charge. You can just get started. We got more than 12,000 developers and organizations already using this to build use cases across different verticals. And on the right hand side, you got a QR code leading you to our Discord community where you can, you know, engage, ask questions, where we're doing our best to, to get back also to open source users who have uh, you know, any questions they want to ask or contributions they want to make. I guess that's it from my side. Again, try to be quick. I was five minutes faster, but we started a bit late. So um, I hope that was useful. And if you have any questions, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Questions had two parts. The first part is in that first triangle, you know, you've got the issuer, the holder, and the verifier. Typically, who has the most influence over sort of like getting these use cases or getting this whole sort of industry, for want of a better word, better? I, I guess it's the issuer. So that's my first question. And then the second question is um, dependent on that answer, but you know, for, for blockchain ecosystems, who are trying to like push forward these initiatives? What, what do you think are the things that they should do? Lunch is calling. Suitable. <laughs> yeah. Apart from the obvious, you know, the obvious make it like a, a trustworthy system. I mean, are there any things that are maybe not so obvious? Sure, sure. Let's start with uh, question one. What's most important? I think your, your head on. So the issuers are very important, not only because they're, they're enabling the supply side of the market, but because issuers are also very well positioned to launch identity wallets. Why? Because if I'm an issuer, I have important information like a government or a bank, I give you a wallet, I can directly populate it with credentials that you can continue to use. So if you're an issuer, you're very well positioned to just help bootstrap the whole ecosystem. Um, your second question, could you, could you rephrase the sure I, I got it. So, so for blockchain ecosystem, yeah. you want their platform to be used. Well, they oh, yeah. These oh, yeah. What are the maybe non-obvious things? Non-obvious, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I th something that we've seen from our customers is that they actually don't really care that much which technology you're using in the beginning for the ecosystem. They're more interested in the use cases, the applications, and the general um, functionality. So for us, the, the customer decision on whether they're using this blockchain or, or that PKI will typically only come in at a later point in time, right? So they start building applications, use cases, make sure that they can demonstrate the value. They may even move to production, but then over time they will have to decide on whether they go for this or that ecosystem. And then obviously there's the regulatory component. Uh, if you want to be compliant with the IDAS2, you got to use the IDAS2 infrastructure for that. But then for everything that's outside of the scope of these regulated use cases, you're basically free to use whatever you want. And so, um, there's a couple of private um, businesses that are building, I want to say, vertical-specific um, ecosystems. Some are focusing on spe special functionality like payments. And then we see also, we've seen also more um, permissionless blockchains at the moment evaluating how they can play a role in this. And I think there's definitely a role to be played, especially if you think about how many people are living in jurisdictions where you cannot really rely on the government. Uh, and so then I think it's all about making sure that you can deliver on the basic promise, which is just a immutable, trusted technology infrastructure uh, that they can build robust applications on. Uh, but then um, I think you also got to, and I have, it's actually on the slide, you also as, a, as an ecosystem have to come up with these governance rules. Um, you cannot rely on, on customers to do this. Governance rules on, okay, if I'm an issuer, let's say um, I'm a bank, what type of verification must I go through, such as that I receive something like, uh, you know, 
public entry that's verified maybe by this ecosystem so that somebody can rely on the fact that that's really this organization. Same goes for, for schemas of credentials themselves, right? Which format, which attributes must be, must be um, included in credentials. So what you want to do is you want to make it as easy as possible then for customers to just plug into your ecosystem and start using it. Maybe use it right next to another ecosystem because again, they won't care. For them, it's just important um, that there's a solution that's viable to achieve their business goals. I hope that's useful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Any other questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, I'll leave you to lunch. <laughs> if you wanna reconnect, I'll be here for a bit, at least for lunch. And uh, thanks for taking the time. <laughs>